large cube here on the right is two times as great as the corresponding length in this small cube. When it comes to area, the surface area of the large cube is four times. So it will be what? Two, four, and in the case of the, the cube, it will be what? Eight times. Right? Two, four, eight. If you compare lengths, surface, volume. So always have that in mind. So you can kind of make that more generic. If a quantity has n intrinsic dimensions, we take the nth root ratio of volumes to the one third, or ratio of edges over the one half, or ratio of lengths to the power one. I want to now talk a little bit about fractals. Because nature uh, seems to use a fractal design over and over. And we want to know what's the reason behind that. Now, what is a fractal? I think some of you have heard me talk about this. Who remembers what a fractal is? Identical curve. Okay. Identical curve things is repeating. Repeating ratio. A different length scale. Huh? Yeah. Yes. So you could say it's a self similarity at different length scales. Huh? Or yet said differently, a fractal is in generally a rough or fragmented geometric shape that can be split into parts, each of which is at least approximately a reduced size copy of the whole. Uh, Probably that's called self-similarity. And so, so many examples like trees, your brain, lungs, cardiovascular systems, they're all examples of fractals. And so people for a long time, they wondered why nature uses fractals so much. Uh, what would be behind this? And maybe uh, this is such an important topic. This is the last thing I will cover for this class today. Uh, there's two reasons that nature designs things in fractals. Let me see if you can come up with them. What does a tree want to do? What's the purpose of the tree? It has a large surface area, right, to interact with the environment. So a fractal tries to maximize the surface area. That's number one. But number two, people don't in general know so well, and it's maybe more important. There's a second point. And I will try to get you in the right direction in your thinking on this. Suppose my heart was not connected to my body through fractal network, but it was connected with nanocapillaries. So suppose my heart looks like that, right. but it's smaller. Right. <coughs> much smaller you know. and say it's connected with nanocapillaries to my whole body I still reach a huge surface area but there's a problem with it what is the problem with it? so number one a fractal wants to maximize surface area but at the same time it wants to there's something wrong with that, right? Nature did not design us with nanocapillaries connected everywhere. It does like this big blood capillary, small, small, small. Yeah? Like fractals. Why? maximizing the surface area while minimizing the amount of work involved in reaching all the points of a surface. Okay. Same with the tree. If a tree would look like, you know, nano capillaries coming out, it would be requiring too much work to pump the liquids through these nano capillaries. And so what you do is you start with a big vessel, split it up, split it up, split it up. So beautiful. That's why nature does it. That's why we have, you know, uh, the delta of a river looks like that. Your brain looks like that. <laughs> your lungs look like that, etc. Nature uses this design over and over, and it's something that uh, rather recently my team at UC Irvine 
has started applying in technology, for example, to make batteries, etc. But before going there, a little bit slower, so we gave this definition of a fractal already. Uh, the, the term fractals was coined by Mandelbrot in 1975, and it's derived from the Latin word fractus. Fractus actually means broken. So a mathematical fractal is based on an equation that undergoes iteration, a form of feedback based on recursion. Uh, by the way, in my book, I go in much more depth mathematically on this, but that would lead me too far. I just want to have uh, you understand there's a very strong mathematical framework behind this, but I will not develop the framework. That would lead me too far. I will come back to that fractal in a while, but before doing that, I want to show you a little bit more about this unbelievable importance of the surface topology. A moment ago we were talking about uh, big mammals and small mammals, right? There's even more consequences uh, of surface to volume as follows uh, in the animal kingdom. If I plot here number of species of this axis, and this is the size of species. Here, for very large animals, let's say, like uh, elephants. There's not too many, right? Why is that? Well, there's not too many niches in nature where an elephant can hide, whereas insects, there's so many niches, insects can go anywhere. Here already, I'm going to see if you pay attention, an insect is smaller than mammals, right? So doesn't it need to eat all the time? What does nature do when it wants to make very small animals? Clever trick. Insect is cold blood. So that's one of the answers nature has found. So I can go smaller in size, right? but then now is my next question: Why, for smaller than an insect, does this go down? When you, again, it's surface to volume. Why do you think you cannot find an animal much smaller than, let's say, a fly? In air, in water, you could. I didn't answer already. What am I saying? Why is this curve going down? So, maximum number of species is insects, right? Because you have so many places where insects can hide, so much food. But then it goes down, right? They will evaporate. They cannot maintain their liquid. Right? Their surface, the volume has become so large, that, that little creature there, it will just evaporate. It will lose its body fluids. Of course, if you would do this in uh, water, it would be different, right? It will be larger on this size. Think about whales. Why? Because water supports them. Right? Here, if you make the animals too large, think about the dinosaurs at the time, they pretty much pushed the boundary because they would become weak. Gravity would just squash them down. But if you're in the water, you can have larger creatures and you can have smaller creatures. So this curve in water is actually for all. So, oh, by the way, another book that I want to recommend to you. First one, what was this guy's name? The inventor, the futurist? Ray, Ray Kurzweil, right? Another one, also a pioneer, uh, but from quite a while ago, his name is Darcy Thompson. And he wrote this book uh, on animal size. It's called On Growth and Form. And he's the one that kind of started applying math to biology. The first one, you could call biomathematics. He would like to say, why does zebra have so many stripes? Why does a shell look like this? He would apply equations to, to biology. And so he's one of the first ones that understood this scaling law. There's a more recent book that does the same by Newt Schmidt Nielsen, and that's called Why is Animal Size So Important? Again, these are not things I can easily ask in a final or midterm, but I like you guys to become real inspired scientists. And these are groundbreaking works that revolutionize our thinking. And you should have an interest in those to read books like this and to become a more mature, wiser person in this whole field. Um, 
This explains the point we were making earlier about the elephant versus the chipmunk. Small mammals must keep on eating to stay warm. Why? Because heat loss tells us L squared, and heat generation through eating is L to the third. And insects avoid their fate, we told you, by being cold blooded. That's why we can have insects at these tremendous numbers, despite the fact that they are smaller than these mammals. Like. As animals get smaller, a greater percentage of their energy intake is required to balance the heat loss. That's why they need to eat more. Huh? On the larger end of the spectrum, if you look on the right now, uh, there are no land animals larger than the African elephant, at 3 meters and 80. Uh, finding the effects of gravity, land animals can only grow so big before becoming too clumsy and inefficient. So there's also very few niches for them available. I will stop the class here, and I'll show you how big an elephant is, and how scary. Here. This is uh, just, what, not a half dog. It's me and my daughter. My daughter is here, so I don't know what kind of but I'm here. And so this is a, a male African elephant. Scary, right? Let me see if I can kill. show it. A tree? Ah. No, it's not a tree, it's an elephant. But let me show you a picture. Oh, I have to change the screen resolution. Oh, this is uh, Halloween in uh, the Royal Anchor. Who has ever come with me to the Royal Anchor? Some of you have. Have you? No. Royal Anchor. Oh, this is this weekend. <coughs> oh, this is uh, also this weekend. So I'll show you something about what I did this weekend. Who knows where this is? Where is this? Yo, home. Home. Home? Someone said home. <laughs> Tumulus, right. Tumulus, Tumulus. Huh? Tumulus is Latin for a hill. This is my favorite tree by far, the ginkgo tree. It's so beautiful at this time of year. This is one of my favorite trees. I call these drunken trees. So suddenly, Julia, I was making oh. pictures of the two. I got no pictures. <laughs> the colors were just beautiful. We did a bike tour to Yongju. See, drunken trees now. Wednesday and we'll uh, finish the scaling class on Wednesday. And so make sure you're all dressed very nicely for uh, Wednesday because again like today this will be on YouTube. Right? So